So we'll record today's lesson. So just a couple of housekeeping pieces before we get into what we're going to actually do today. Um, I created a folder called Lesson Videos that you'll see in Blackboard. Uh, video one was posted <laughs> pretty much the next day. Uh, I'll keep doing that, so I'll record today's lesson, and then at work tomorrow morning, I'll try to upload it to YouTube so you guys have it in the morning right away, and then you can review it. Now, I have been told before that I, I can talk a little quicker, which I realize that for international students, that can be a bit difficult. I will try to slow down a little bit in this class. That being said, it's part of the reason why I record the videos, so that you guys can review them if you need to, okay? But I will try to slow down a bit. Uh, in addition, I, I'm not sure if I actually discussed the resource folder. The resource folder contains all of our resources. So that's links to XAMPP, links to uh, GitHub and stuff like that, plus my GitHub where my source code is. So you guys can actually see that source code, which we will learn to push today. And then going forward, the source code will be pushed to GitHub. So you'll be able to take a look at your code, compare it to my code, and see if there's some kind of sort of mistake. Uh, the Slack invite link is there as well. I'll say it again. It's the easiest, quickest way to get a hold of me, so I do recommend in, um, enrolling into the Slack. Uh, you can download the Slack applications onto your phones, tablets, computer, desktop, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the benefit to that is you get notifications. Uh, so if I message you back, uh, you'll get your notification right away. And then plus you remain signed in. You don't have to keep signing in like you would through the browser. All right. So uh, if you go to weekly learning, I have week two posted there. So lesson two today is going to be, the first part will be GitHub. Now the unfortunate part of that is, yay, we get to install another tool. <laughs> uh, however, this is an industry standard tool. You should get very familiar with this tool because you're going to be using it quite a bit when you go out on co-ops and stuff like that. Um, doesn't even matter if you're working in a Java environment, you will probably still likely use GitHub. GitHub is pretty across the board for any programming shop whatsoever. So we're going to learn GitHub just a very, very basic amount. We're going to learn how to take our code and push it to GitHub, which is a remote repository. That's it. We're not going to learn about branches today. Uh, we won't learn how to do merges or anything like that. However, when we hit into MVC, we'll talk about it then uh, so that you and your groups can collaborate a little better. But we'll deal with that then. <clears throat> We're going to do a PHP syntax crash course. So last week we kind of like steamrolled through a chunk of PHP that probably didn't make a lot of sense, which is totally fine. It's really just to evaluate that we could get something in your browser and onboard and troubleshoot any problems that your environment may be having. However, today we're going to take it nice and slow. We're going to start with the very basics. We're going to start with uh, commenting, uh, conditional structures, repetition structures, variables, arrays, just the basics. Okay. After that, if we have time, if we don't, that's totally fine. But if we have time, we're going to do a very minor HTML review with a bit of PHP in it. What we'll do is we'll create a form and we will post it and then use PHP to process it. So that's our goal if we can hit that point today. If we don't, not a big deal because next week we're going to be starting into CRUD and we'll be doing that exact same process next week anyways. So not a big deal. We'll take it nice and slow, get everything done. Um, that's the goal. Now, I know a couple of you already have Git and understand Git. If that's the case, I'm aiming to have the lesson for Git finished by 8 o'clock. If you want to jet out for a little bit, that's totally fine and just come back at 8. Um, and then we'll start into the PHP syntax lesson. Actually, probably 8, 10, because we'll have a break. Um, that's totally fine if you want to do that. If you don't know Git, then I recommend staying because that's how I expect you to hand your projects and stuff in is through Git. So we'll def definitely need to do that. Um, Cool. Any questions about any of that? So usually we'll do a review at the beginning of class, but last week there isn't much to review. Uh, so there's, we're not going to review this class, but next week we will review for sure. Okay? <coughs> cool. So let's get started. Let's go to lesson two. And as 
as usual, my lesson plan is the top link. So go ahead and click on that because valuable links we will need are in that. And let's, uh, let's talk about Git a little bit. How many of you are familiar or at least heard the word Git? Yeah, a few of you? Okay. <clears throat> so Git, right? It's one of these industry terms that you're going to hear quite a bit. Um, what Git actually is, is it's a version control platform. What version control basically means, you can think of it like a snapshot in history, right? It's like taking a picture of your code at a certain point in history. The benefits to that are that as you modify your code, right, as you go along and add more to your project, you can actually take a look at your code and say, oh, I made a mistake, and roll back to a different point in history, right? So you don't have to worry about damaging your code base by adding new features because you can always roll back to a different point in time. In addition to that, Git gives you even more control. When you're collaborating with other people, you can actually give them their own version of your code base, and that's called branching. You basically give them their own branch. They develop what it is that they want to actually develop. They can then submit that for your review. You can decide whether or not you want that to be a part of your main application, and then you can actually merge it into your application. Because of the type of tool it is, because of the control it gives us, it is an industry standard tool. It is something during your programming career you will definitely see and it is invaluable for you to know how to use it. Um, because getting a job with not knowing Git will be very difficult. So I definitely recommend learning Git. So we're going to touch just basically the surface of it. We're going to learn how to put Git on our computers. That will be our first step. Our second step will to be initialize a repository on our system. So basically we will take, we'll go into our comp 1006 folders that we created and we'll initialize those as a Git repository. Then we will go on to GitHub, which is an online remote repository system. We will create a repository, we'll create an account, then we'll create a repository. And then we'll learn how to take our code that's local on our machines and push that up to GitHub so that it's remote and sitting on an online repository. That's our goal, all right? <clears throat> so the first step that we're going to actually have to do is, you know what, let's sign up to GitHub because that's actually the easiest of the two steps that we need to do. So I will sign out so you can see the screen that I'm going to see. So if you go to github.com, it's going to look like this. And the first page is where you would enter the username that you want to have, the email address that you want to associate it with, and the password you want to use, okay? So if you have a GitHub account, just sign in. But if you don't, I need you to register for GitHub, okay? So go ahead and do that now. <clears throat> Notice that GitHub is one of these companies that gives you one password field and doesn't give you a second to validate it, so make sure you type your password in right. You can use your, I would recommend using your student email. Um, Georgian College actually gives you, I think it's a whole bunch of crap free with, with GitHub. It's like free repositories and some online stuff, plus a whole bunch of AWS stuff. It's definitely worthwhile to use your student email address as your sign-in address. While you're doing that, I'll just tell you as well, there will be a quiz that will open at 9 o'clock. It will just be on the, um, it'll be a little bit about Git, and it'll be a little bit about our review, like just our PHP syntax stuff. Uh, the password this week will be not password. That'll be the password this week. Once you've created an account, you might have to go to your email and confirm it. It might ask you to confirm that you have registered, right? So make sure you do that step. And then once you're ready, I would like you to sign in to GitHub.
out of curiosity, who's still signing up? So I can have an idea, a couple of you. Now it is okay for you to own multiple GitHub accounts. I have multiples. I have one that's specifically for work. I have my Georgian student one that I use for you guys. Um, and then I also have my own personal for my own projects. Uh, I like having the three different GitHubs because then I can keep my stuff nice and separate. The security for GitHub can be quite severe. You can do two-factor authentication if you want to make it extremely secure. You can also make it so that the only way you can access repositories in GitHub is with an SSH key. So you can get very, very secure with your GitHubs. Or your repositories. And a fun fact, GitHub is now owned by Microsoft which people were kind of a little bit upset about when it happened, but now it's not so bad because now we get free private repos, which we didn't have before. So it's, that's at least one good thing to it. <clears throat> Anybody still signing up? No? Uh, a couple of you? Yeah? Just out of curiosity, how many of you are logged in? Just so I can... See, okay, a whole bunch of you. Awesome. In the notes, you will notice that I put in some a glossary at the top here that tells you different terms. These are the terms that I'll use so that you guys learn the basic terms for a Git, uh, such as init, which means to initialize a Git repo. Um, there's pull, which means to pull your stuff from uh, your online repository. Push, which means to push your local code to your online repository. Merge, which we'll deal with later. Checkout, we'll deal with later. And branch, we will deal with later. Uh, repository is the place where you're going to put your code. And remote is always a reference to GitHub for us. <coughs> Whenever I say remote, I'm talking about GitHub. Local is your personal computer. <laughs> is anybody having difficulty signing up, just so I know? No? OK, good. All right, are we there? Is everybody signed up? Anybody still signing up? Still going through? OK. <laughs> We're going to have to come up with a repository name. The good news is that every single person can title their repository the exact same name because it uses your GitHub ID and then slash whatever your repository name is. So we can all have Comp 1006 repository that is completely doable. Okay. I will probably call my Comp 1006 Wednesday meetings. I have three classes, so. All right, brother Ian. Yes? Are you logged in? No?
Way ahead of the game. <laughs> We're just waiting for people to sign up. So. Please verify your inside address. Go to your North Falls email address. It might take a second to get to you if it doesn't. Log into your North Falls email address. <laughs> Choose the free plan. Unless you want to pay for it, it's totally up to you. <laughs> I'm not paying for it. Why are you paying for it? Oh, he's just throwing the money away. <laughs> Making it rain. <laughs> If you're sitting beside somebody who's having a bit of difficulty, give them a hand, please. <coughs> All right. Let's move to the next step of creating an actual repository. Now, if you log in, yours might not look like this. There is a repositories. Here, I'll see if I can get to it. Uh, yes. If you are at this screen where you have overview, repositories, projects, what I want you to do is just click repositories. That'll take you to this screen here. Now, you won't have repositories listed. It'll be blank. But what you will notice is there's this button at the top right-hand corner that says new. We're going to click that new button to create a new repository. Very simple. Just click the new button. So what you're first going to see, don't you fill this out, fill it out with me, so that way you've got it perfect. You'll see your username, and you'll see the field that says repository. In that field that says repository, what I would like you to type 
is comp 1006, all lowercase letters, please. Okay, that's got a problem. Now you'll see mine says it already exists, right? Yours should not say that. I'm just going to add one other piece that you don't need to add, and that is WED, just so I know it's Wednesday's class. Okay? Is yours still not giving you... All right, so make sure you've typed COMP 1006. You can give a description. The description that I would type in here if you're going to do it is just the description of the class, which is Introduction to Web Programming Using PHP. Easy to understand description. You're going to see two radio buttons. One is public and one is private. This obviously, hopefully this makes sense. Public means the whole world can see it. Private means only you who's logged in can see it. Or other collaborators that you've given access can see it. That's the way that works. So what I would recommend, because we're going to be putting database credentials in here, we don't want to accidentally expose our database credentials. I'm going to show you how to not put your database credentials into your repository. However, I've had students, many students in the past, accidentally do it anyways. So just to avoid somebody taking advantage of that and dumping a bunch of porn into your database, why don't we click private, then anything we put in there will be just our stuff. Okay? So make sure you click private. The side effect to this is when we go to do our first push from our laptops, we will have to authorize GitHub. That's all. The last step, down at the bottom there, you'll see initialize this repository with the readme. We don't need to do that because we're going to take our existing code base and force it up anyways. Um, that being said, though, yeah, just leave that empty. Your absolute last step is to create repository, the green button at the very bottom. Now, if you have gotten lost during this setup, what you will notice in your lesson plan is I walk you through with screenshots, step by step, how to set up a repository. So you always have that. So if you forget how to set up a repository, there it is step by step on how to actually set up the repository. So don't worry if you get behind or you get lost, okay? Cool, so go ahead and click create repository. Now they're super cool, they give you the actual commands you need in order to initialize it. Don't pay attention to those. I'm gonna walk you through on how to initialize your repository. Quick question. Anybody in here using Windows 7? Good. <laughs> Anybody in here using a Mac besides me? No? All right, cool. So on your Windows 10 machine, right, you have command prompt. How many of you have heard of command prompt? A few of you. Okay. There's also something called PowerShell. The benefits of PowerShell is a lot of the commands mimic Linux. So it makes it easier when I'm using a Mac and you guys are using PowerShell, our commands look similar. So it's a little easier for me to teach you what you need to do. 
So we're going to use PowerShell. So what I want you to do on your Windows machine, down where the Cortana bar is, a little search bar, I want you to type in PowerShell, P-O-W-E-R-S-H-E-L-L. -L. It will look like, do, 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 do. It'll look like that. Say Windows PowerShell. Now, one more step. If you've already opened it, close it, please. What I want you to do is, sorry, I want you to right click on it and run it as administrator because you need administrator privileges in order to initialize GitHub. Oh crap, actually I got ahead of myself. <laughs> we have another step before this one. <laughs> you kind of need Git first. <laughs> All right. In the documentation here, you'll see this link saying navigate to git-scm downloads. Right here, git-scm.com downloads. You need to navigate to there. If you already have Git on your system, do not reinstall Git. You might mess up your path sort of Most of you do not. So just go to get-scm.com and download. That'll take you here. Obviously, download the executable for your machine. So if you're on Windows, click the Windows download button. <coughs> You're going to want the 64-bit version, because I doubt any of you have a computer from 2001. Um, you're going to want the 64-bit version. Okay. Trying to remember if I captured the settings for that one. I did not. <coughs> Just go through the installation process, click next, 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 next. And don't change any of the settings. Did you hear me? That's super important. Do not change the settings as you install it, because you need to make sure it gets added to your Windows path, and doing that manually is not the easiest. So just download that, the 64-bit version. So this one here, the one that I just highlighted, download that version and install it. Once it is done installing, I want you to restart your computer. Yeah. I mean, it's not really going to make a difference. It's just that if you if you run the git edit or whatever, it will open your code editor for it. That's all it is. That's why. Yep. Go to your 
Once you have installed it, just restart your computer that way. The PowerShell and everything else gets updated. It's in the path where it needs to be, all that wonderful stuff. Yeah. I'll show you guys how to actually make sure it's installed. This is a command we're going to run in PowerShell. Once your computer restarts, I want you to run PowerShell as an administrator. Now, I'm not going to be using PowerShell. I'll be using Terminal. It's actually called my term. Same idea. It's just a shell. It's the same as what your shell is. It doesn't look the exact same. That's all. All you need to do on your computer is type in where space GIT and hit enter. And then that's going to tell you, it's going to give you uh, two lines. It's going to say C colon slash binary something or whatever. Um, that will be to tell you where it's installed. That will tell you that it is installed. If you get an error, then there was a problem installing it. Where space git. If you're on a Mac, it's which git. So W H I C H space git. If you're on a Mac. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, who's still installing git? One person? Is it just still downloading or are you stuck? <laughs> oh, you're just restarting? Awesome. Okay, cool. Let's give it another minute or so just for that computer to restart. And then we'll be able to start this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't open Git Bash, just open PowerShell. Thank you. 
The other way to check if Git is installed, if you're not, hello? The other way to check if Git is installed is Git dash dash version. Hit enter and it will tell you which version of Git you are currently using. One second I'll be over. I think everybody basically has Git installed from what I've seen, so we're good. So we need to do a couple of things. I'm guessing this is likely one of the first classes you've had where you've even opened a terminal. So <laughs> when you have classes with Sean, you will likely open a terminal. You're not even used to this one. There's a few different ways that we can initialize there's a few different ways we can initialize our project, but it means that we have to navigate to the project's folder. Navigating in terminal can be a little tricky because you kind of have to first know where you want, right? So you open up your terminal and your first question will be like, cool, where am I? I have no idea where I am in my file structure. The way you do that in Windows, you type DIR and hit enter. What DIR will do I will type my version of it, which is PWD. What DIR will do is tell you the directory that you are currently located in. <laughs> the command to move through our directories, it's kind of important you hear what I'm saying or you're going to get stuck. 
The command to move through the directories is CD. That's true on Windows and true on Mac. So if I want to move up a directory, I can go CD and I can hit tab and it will show me the list of all the directories currently in that area. And then I can type in whatever it is I want to type in next. So SSL, for example, right? And now I'm up a directory. If I want to get a list of the directories in there, I can also use DIR for that as well. And DRR will give me a list of all the directories that I have access in that area. So I'm sure you're saying there must be an easier way than navigating through my terminal. How can I do this for my file explorer? And you can. In Windows, unfortunately I can't mimic this for you, but in Windows, if you go to File Explorer, navigate to whatever directory it is you want, and click in the address bar, the whole URL you need will show up in that address bar. You can copy that, go to your terminal, type CD space, paste it, hit enter, and it will navigate directly into that directory for you. Okay? So why don't we do that? Because the directory that we need to go into is our htdocs directory that is currently sitting in XAMPP or WAMP or wherever you have it. So we'll do that first. So open up your file explorer. And if you're on Windows, it's under C, I believe it's under C colon, hold on, it's under C colon XAMPP slash htdocs, right? and then probably comp 1006 or whatever, but just go to that folder. If you're using WAMP, it's under C colon WAMP 64 or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. WWW. Okay. If you're on a Mac, you have to mount the directory, and then it's under opt LAMP. So this is Windows XAMPP. This is Windows, WAMP, and this is Mac. Not Macs, Mac. Okay. So in your file explorer, open up your file explorer and navigate to your htdocs folder. Now I can't unfortunately show you on my Mac because it doesn't look exactly the same. But once you've done that, up at the top, I'll draw a picture. How's that sound? Here's what your file explorer looks like, right? You got this little side panel with your things in it. You got this, like so, and you've got your little folders, right? That's a folder. And then up here, you've got your path, right? What I want you to do is click that path and then copy the contents. So first we need to go get the path. So go to your file Thank you. 
the impact. The impact is weird because it actually builds up the limits of the inside and kind of separates it from the limits. So I can inch the power shell without waiting until the windows operate. All right, so once you've copied that path, you're going to go to your terminal. You're going to type in CD, paste the path in, and hit enter, and it will CD into that path. Of course, mine's not going to because it's in a weird directory. Just give me a second. I have to actually pull mine open a bit differently than yours. Are you kidding me? Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> so go ahead and see the internet directory in your PowerShell. Don't use the internet. And you should see the directory pop up as the directory you're in. If you don't see it, type it in the Very slowly making progress here. We are slowly making progress. Yeah, so just to give you a little bit of insight, the reason why mine only shows Comp 1006. Is because I'm using a shell known as iTerm, and 
it does this type of stuff for me. It's just because I use this computer in my day job. I do it all the time. So some of this has been customized for my own personal use, right? So it's not going to look exactly the same as yours. The other issue is I'm using Mac. You guys are using Windows. We're using two completely different operating systems. They operate a little bit differently than each other. So some of the stuff I show you will be different. However, the good news is all the git commands we're about to use are exactly the same. Every single git command we're going to do will be the same. Now, I noticed as I was going around, some of you don't have this comp 1006 directory in that XAMPP folder. We need to make sure that exists. So before we go further, I'm going to just come down here. You need, if you're running XAMPP, you should have c colon slash xamp slash htdocs comp 1006 and hopefully a lesson one folder. Okay, That's what should be in there currently in your xamp. If you're using wamp, you should have c colon slash wamp 64 or whatever it is. I can't remember the directory name www comp 1006 lesson 01. So if you have if you are using XAMP, the little orange with the white X in it, your directory structure should look like that. If you're using WAMP, which I think some of you are, your directory structure should look like that. So just make sure you've done that. <laughs> folder, make the folder, right? Just a few minutes to do. If for some reason you didn't have less than one last week, for whatever reason, I'm going to push my code and we'll populate this with less than one's code, so don't worry about it. All right, let's initialize here. What I would like you to do in your PowerShell, right? And like I said before, your PowerShell looks different than mine. Do not use git bash. It basically boots up a tiny little instance of Linux. It separates it from the whole Windows shell. You have to do some configurations to stop that from happening. It's a huge headache. Just use Windows PowerShell for now. Much easier. Everybody should be in the COP 1006 directory. Do not drill down into lesson one. Make sure, and I'll say this like three times, make sure you are in COP 1006. Make sure you are in COP 1006 because when we initialize this Git repo, we want to make sure that all of our future lessons wind up in the same repository. <clears throat> if you're in lesson one, you'll wind up initializing in the wrong directory. Okay, so make sure you're in COP 1006. Our first step, everybody needs to make sure they have Git. So we're going to do, I'm going to zoom in a bit so you can see. There we go. Everybody can see that okay? Cool. We're going to do Git space dash dash version, B-E-R-S-I-O-N, and hit enter. And it should say you have Git version 2 or 3 or some kind of version. It doesn't matter if your git is different than my git because the commands haven't changed in the last five years. So, basically the same. Okay? Does anybody not have a git version? Oh, that's good. That's awesome. Either you're lying or that's great. <laughs> so, we're good. Cool. Now we're ready to initialize. And initializing git is super simple. It's literally git. Every command we're going to type is going to start with the word git. Git init. So short for initialize. It's a nit. Hit enter. 
And it will come up and say, initialize MP git repository in block. Now my terminal does some kind of interesting things. You're not going to see the same thing. It actually tells me what Git branch I'm on. It does all that wonderful stuff, which is handy for me, not necessarily so handy for you. So make sure you type git and it. Some of you got hung up on versions, so just make sure you've typed git and it. That will create an empty repository in that directory for us. <laughs> When we're doing git stuff, it's usually a good idea before we do any type of pushing or pulling to a remote repository to see what we've done, to see if we've actually done anything at all. And the way we do that is we use a command called git status. So we do git space status, S-T-A-T-U-S. -T and then hit enter. That's going to tell you some information about your current Git situation, right? So in this particular one, it tells me you're on branch master. We'll be on branch master until about the next term. Then it will say, you have this many commits. Well, we don't have any commits yet, right? We'll talk about that in a second, what a commit is. And it will also say, you have these untracked files. It says files, those are folders that contain files. But it's basically saying, these three things you are currently not tracking with Git. So we're not listening to them, we're not watching them, we're not paying attention to them. If you want us to pay attention to this, you need to use git add file to include what we committed. Don't do that yet. That's totally fine, we will do that. We will commit our stuff, that's not a big deal. The easiest way to do that, there's two different ways. We can either git add a specific file, okay? So we could git add lesson one, or we can git add the whole batch. And the way we do that is by typing in git add dot. Dot is a wildcard that says add all of these. You may be like, well, why would I ever just add one of these? The reason is, is that when you're working on a large project and you've made multiple different changes, you may want to write multiple different commit messages. So you may add a file and then say what you did, add a file and say what you did, right? Okay. Go ahead and hit enter. This is wonderful information. If you get no information back, no messages, that's good, it's been added. The way we can double check is git status. <laughs> when you type git status now, it will give you a list of files that are currently waiting to be committed. What add does is basically says to git, hey, take these things I've just done and track them. If I want to add them to my local repository so they've actually been added to the repository, I've taken my snapshot at that time in history, I need to actually commit them. And the way I do that, I'm going to clear my screen, so I apologize if it freaks you out. This makes it easier for you to see. I'm going to do git commit dash m quote 
my initial commit. That message between those quotes can be whatever you want, and it should be descriptive. It should explain what changes you actually made, right? For now, we're just going to say my initial commit. The dash M is known as a shell flag. Basically, what it does is it triggers something and says, hey, I'm adding a message to this. You can get commit without a message. Not a good idea. Don't get in that habit. Always stay in this habit where you're committing a message. It'll make it much easier in the future when you're going through 10,000 commits to find where you made that one change. Hit enter, and now it will say create mode, and a bunch of things will happen. Now, on Windows, you may get a bunch of LN, FN things. The reason why you're getting that is because some of the files in your system came from me, which I run a Mac, so the directory structure system is a little different than your directory testing system, and that's why you're getting those little weird messages. Nothing's wrong, no errors. If you get an error, it will be red. Yes. You're literally going to show me the thing I just said. Uh, I'm able to auto the IP address. What are you doing? Oh, it wants it to tell you who it is. Okay, so you know it's actually cool because it tells you right off the bat to write these things. So you can do git config. So if you get this weird message that says, hey, I want to know who you are. If you read what it says, it says type git config. What's the whole thing? It's git config dash user. Global user, like this? Space user? There's two dashes? So it's dash dash global user at something? Okay, so it'll be global and likely your email. Oh, it's user.email. I see what you're doing. All right, so it'll be git config user dot email. And then you just type your email address, whatever that happens to be. Like so. If you have Git and it's brand new, you will likely have to do this. So it's Git config, do the email line, and that's the next one. That's fine. <laughs> so it's git config dash dash local user dot email and whatever your email address is. What's that? Uh, you don't have to, but yeah, it will be better. It would be easier. I would use the one that you did for your GitHub email because it would make your lives a little simpler, um, but not much. And then what was the second command? <coughs> Git config. Is it the username one? Yeah. User.name. And then the next one will be user.name, and will look like this. I'm just going to write these in, hold on, I'm going to write them in Sublime. <coughs> There. So those two commands you may have to run. Set up. <laughs> and 
And once you've done that, the commit will work. That commit will, all it's done is take your files and created a commitment to it, and it's added it to your local repository. They don't exist on GitHub yet. And you can see that because if you navigate to GitHub and refresh the repository window, you'll notice that there's no code inside your repository yet, right? That's because we actually have to add GitHub as a remote repository that our local repository is allowed to push to. And it sounds complex, but it's actually not that bad. It's pretty easy, and you only need to do it every time you do a project. It's the first thing you will do when you do the project. The good news is this lesson plan contains the exact notes you need in order to do that step by step, so, and you'll, this will always be online. Um, so you always have access to that if you need a quick reference point. <clears throat> so let's walk through how to actually do that. Jump over to Google Chrome or whatever you're using. Jump over to GitHub where your repository is. And you likely have this weird screen here because we don't have any files in there. You will notice that it says HTTPS or SSH. We want the HTTPS option. SSH is a little bit more advanced. It would require you to generate keys on your system. And then the link next to it, you want to copy. You can click the little clipboard or just highlight the contents inside and copy them. Either one works. <coughs> that is your repository link. So go ahead and copy that. Once you have that copied, jump back over to PowerShell. I'm just going to clear my screen. <coughs> All right. What we're going to do is we're going to add that link as a remote option for us to push to. And that looks like this. Git remote add. We need to name it. We always usually call it origin. <coughs> so git, don't hit enter yet. Git remote add origin and then paste the link in. So it's git remote add origin and your link, not my link. I need to stress that. Do not copy and paste my link in or type my link out because it's not going to do you any good with their high credentials. You need your link your repository. <clears throat> okay, once you're done that, just hit enter. <coughs> and if it worked, I'm sorry, I've got a cold, I'm still dealing with it. <coughs> if it worked, you should see no error messages, it should just literally come up with the prompt next. We're almost there. To make sure it worked, Type in git remote dash v and hit enter and you will see two lines, the origin for fetch and the origin for push. Those should pop up for you. When we're collaborating with other people because they can create their own branches and you may have tons and tons of branches and code changes and stuff like that, it's always a good idea that when you first initialize a repository that you type in git fetch and it will retrieve any current content that's up there. So just do git fetch and hit enter. Not a problem. It's going to give us an error because there's one more setting that we actually have to do to make this work. <laughs> we have to set our upstream. You didn't get an error, yours just worked? Okay. I might have a different origin set with mine right now. That's why I'm getting my error. I'll figure that out in a second. Let's just set our upstream. Our upstream, we do git push. So git push dash dash set upstream origin master. So origin is the name of the remote that we're using. And master is the name of the branch that we're pushing. Hit enter. I'm going to get an error. You're not. I'm going 
going to have to figure out why I'm getting errors here or not. But I think we'll figure it out. It's probably because I need to log in. It's actually not finding it, which is usually a sign that it's a credentials issue. I have like four different credentials on the two sheets, so I just need to make sure I get the right one set up with it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, it will. Yeah. So if it works, it will likely ask you to log into your GitHub account. So you just need to fill in your GitHub details.
One second.
Okay. <clears throat> I think we're gonna put Git on. Um, I think we're gonna put Git on the shelf for a little bit. Looks like we're having lots of issues with different credentials issues and repo issues, and I have a funny feeling a lot of it is just some permissions problems that we're having. Um, I'm going to record a video this weekend on my Windows machine. I'm going to record a video this weekend on my Windows machine on how to remove everything we did and re-add it all from scratch and how to set up the credentials properly. I think we'll get a lot further that way. We're already at 8.30 and we definitely need to get into some PHP development. And at the end of the day, Git is very secondary to what we need to do. I thought it was going to go a little quicker, but it's not. So we'll do that. So don't worry about your Git right now. Just close out of your PowerShell for now because we're going to have to go a little bit further than what we are. <clears throat> All right. Do apologize for that. Like I said, I'll record a video and I'll post it online. Um, that way, you guys can follow that over the weekend on how to add Git to your uh, to your computers and how to remove your current. <clears throat> and it also looks just incidentally. I noticed that some of you already have Git. Um, when we install tools, if you already have the tool, it's usually not a good idea to install the tool a second time. Okay. That's like a rule of thumb for any tool you might use, just for advanced knowledge, right? So kind of like if you have Microsoft Word already, don't install Microsoft Word again <laughs> because you'll wind up with conflicts in your system. That's just a rule of thumb with computers in general. Um, but let's go through the lesson plan. Let's see where we're at right now. <clears throat> All right, PHP syntax. Let's take a look at the actual PHP syntax that we're going to be using over the next week. Now, you guys have had programming already. Um, so really all this is is now applying your different programming concepts to PHP syntax, right? So you guys have used commenting before in Java. You've made variables in Java. You've made arrays. You've done conditional structures. You've done loop structures, right? These are things that you guys should already have a basic understanding of those concepts because you've done them in intro to programming and you did them in your Java class, right? So what we're going to do now is go through those same kind of structures in a crash course on replicating those same things you learned in Java and intro to programming in PHP. So that way you kind of know how they're done. What you should wind up with by the time we're done this lesson is a nice little cheat sheet that you can refer to whenever you need to make one of these structures, right? <clears throat> so I did give you under lesson two, there is lesson two starter files. If you want to click on those, and what I would like you to do is download those into your XAMPP HT docs folder, or if you're running WAMP, Download them into the www folder under the COM 1006 directory, right? So I'm going to save my zip there, and it's going to go there. Then I'm going to tell it that I want to see it in my explorer, right? You guys should have an option to show it folder. Go ahead and extract the zip file. It should create a new directory for you called lesson two. And then remove the existing zip file. Now I'm just going to rename my directory because, like I said before, I teach multiple versions of this class. So I just need to make sure we have Wednesday's version. So I'm going to call mine Wednesday. What I would like you to do next is open up your IDE, whether you're using Atom or VS Code or Sublime or whatever IDE you're actually using. Go ahead and open up that IDE. And then open that folder in that IDE. Okay? You can just go to File and Open to do that. Go to File, Open, and navigate to that folder, and then open it. So you would go, I can see the confused expressions. Go to File, Open, navigate to where that directory is to XAMPP or WAMP or whatever it is you're using. Go to your HTDocs or your www folder, 
Go to Comp 1006, Lesson 2, and click Open. <coughs> In this directory, you will see a PHP syntax.php file. That's the file we're going to work in. So go ahead and open that file. All right. Our next step, we're going to open up this file inside our internet browser and make sure that we can see it so that we, when we code, we can actually refer back to it and refresh it, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to actually dock my screen over to the right, or to the left, I mean. I'm going to move Chrome to the right. Open up XAMPP or WAMP, or whatever it is you're running, and make sure it's running. My XAMPP looks different than yours. Yours looks more like that image I showed you last time. <clears throat> Yours looks like this. So open up XAMPP. You find it under the XAMPP control under your C panel, or sorry, under your C drive. And you're going to press start inside Apache and start inside MySQL so that those two things are running. Okay, so start Apache and start MySQL. If you're in WAMP, just click on the little W and click start all services if you haven't already. Now just a note, remember how I said don't install multiple versions of one software? The same applies to running multiple versions of the same software, uh, at least when it comes to server-side softwares like XAMPP or MySQL. Only run one version of XAMPP. So if you open up the little triangle on the bottom of your screen and there's like 14 little orange squares there, you need to close 13 of them. Okay? And make sure only one is running. So to make sure that we actually have this working, you should be able to navigate to HTTP colon slash slash localhost. And when you hit enter, it will go to that dashboard that looks like this. OK? So it's HTTP slash localhost. Do not type the address that you see in mind. Matt does something kind of crazy. Instead of putting it on the local host, it actually instantiates an IP address and gives me an IP address. But you guys are HTTP slash slash localhost. And that should go to your dashboard. Obviously, we don't want to be in the dashboard. We want to be in the actual folder that we're working in. So we're going to need to navigate to comp 1006 instead of dashboard. And hit enter. And then what's cool is it will actually show a preview of all of the folders inside that directory. And then obviously, to get to lesson two, you just click on lesson two. And that'll add it. And then to get to the file we're working on, it's php-syntax.php. And that's what you will see once you get there. Yes. After what? After putting it into Adam, go into your Chrome. Uh, go up to HTTP, uh, local host, 
slash comp type of six, so I don't need to look at what's correct here. Needs to look at that. opening XAMPP, we're going to have to do it after class because unfortunately people are still waiting. It's likely something to do to your environment. You're either running multiple versions of XAMPP, you've installed WAMP and XAMPP, or you've installed another server of some sort and you're blocking ports. So unfortunately I can't make everybody wait to fix that, so we're just going to have to go through the code that we have here, and then after class I'll have to help you fix your environment, but it will have to wait till after class. <clears throat> All right. So for now, just if your server is not running, that's okay. Just follow along to the best of your ability. Write the syntax out, and then we'll attempt to fix it after class. <clears throat> so make sure you have at least the lesson folder open here on your left side, right? Or open it all the way, totally up to you. Because I'll just refresh the screen so you can see the updated syntax on the right-hand side. <clears throat> All right, PHP syntax, pretty easy stuff. That's why it's one of the best languages for web programming. It's an interpretive language. It requires no compilation, so you don't need a compiler to do it. You just need the PHP binary in order to interpret the code. You need a working server, obviously, so you need a patch in order to do that, and then the PHP binary. <clears throat> 
There's a bunch of different pieces that I want to go through that you're going to come into contact with. And a lot of them have to do with things that are simple. The first one we're going to look at is commenting, right? Because commenting code, absolutely essential. Something you definitely need to do, right? You need to comment your code so that you tell other people who are looking at your code on exactly what they're reading, right? So the way we comment code, actually the first piece we need to know is how to write a PHP tag. PHP tags, you're going to write them all the time. There's various ones that you'll see on the internet. The ones that you should write are these ones, which is the opening tag, which looks like that. So it's a less than sign, a question mark with the word PHP in it. And the closing tag, which looks like that, question mark and a greater than sign. That's the complete set of tags. All the code that we write in between those two tags will be interpreted as PHP. That means the PHP parser will go through and parse that code. The cool thing about PHP is that we can litter HTML and PHP together. Anywhere we have PHP tags, they'll be interpreted as PHP. Anywhere we have HTML, it will be parsed as HTML, which is really cool because then we can have both all together. <coughs> so often what we'll do if we're writing a lot of PHP in a row, we'll take these two tags and we'll split them to their own lines. Then we'll write our PHP in the middle. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have written JavaScript before? So this is closer to what you would do in a JavaScript file if you had script tags at the top and bottom inside your HTML file. Kind of the same idea. The code inside these tags can be literally anything you want to write as long as it's PHP syntax, right? Let's write a comment. These are PHP tags. This comment is a single line comment even though my IDE is kind of wrapping it. I'll just stretch it out a bit so you can see. This is known as a single line comment. Single line because it only goes on one line, right? If I want to write a second line using the same syntax, I need to add another two slashes and say this is a second line, right? <clears throat> if I want to write multiple lines and I don't feel like having to write slash slash before every single one of them, I can use the multi-line syntax, which looks like this. It's a slash and a star, and it closes with a star slash. Then in the middle, these are multi-line comments, like so. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that exactly the same as Java? Yeah. So That should be old hat. Nice and familiar. It's also the same in JavaScript, which will make things handy for you in the future. <clears throat> so that's commenting in a nutshell. Now the thing about commenting that's really cool, if I save this and I refresh my browser, you'll notice you can't see any of this information in my browser. But it goes a step further. If I right click and choose to view the page source, if I can view the darn page source, there we go. View the page source, and I come here where we've written our actual tags and commenting, you'll notice the commenting isn't in the page source either. That's because PHP does not parse out to HTML, that it won't take the comments and parse that into HTML comments. So any comments you write in your PHP, they're safe and secure, only you can see them in your code. It won't go out to the user's page source. Can you have a separate PHP file? Yeah, you totally can. Yeah, you can have an entirely separated PHP file and then include it into your HTML file. PHP is a little different than JavaScript, though. That's very common in JavaScript. People don't like to litter their JavaScript in their HTML and they keep those two things separate. But when we're working with server-side technologies, we tend to litter them together because we basically use the HTML as a way to template out what we want to say. That's the idea. So you will wind up writing PHP and HTML together all the time. That's a common practice. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question, though. 
All right. Often, we're going to want to print something to the screen for the user to see. And there is the common print command, which probably exists in Java as well, because it exists in every language. But we don't use the print command. We use a different command, and that command is called echo. Echo is the common way for us to be able to take information that we have that we want to present to the user inside their client, right? So the way we do that, we write our set of PHP tags. Because like I said, everything goes between PHP tags. <coughs> and why don't we do the very classic hello world, right? We just simply say echo, that's the name of the command, hello world. Now like I was just saying to this gentleman over here, it's very common for us to interlace PHP with our HTML. And because of that, often you will write a single line statement like this and output a piece of information within actual PHP text. That is a very common practice. Obviously, writing it like this, we get a little bulk in it. If I want to write just something out to a PHP tag, let's say maybe in the set of a paragraph, I want to be able to do it within one line. And PHP knows that you want to do that, so they provide some syntax helpers that actually make that a little easier. So I can do it this way. I can write it PHP echo hello world all on one line. That is valid syntax. That is totally usable. I can show you that right now. If I save and refresh this screen, you can see hello world, hello world right here being printed out to the screen. But I can actually do one better. and use the shorthand echo statement. The shorthand echo statement starts with a PHP opening tag, but replaces the word PHP with an equal sign. And that statement means echo. It's the absolute equivalence of the sentence above it. Save that, print it out to the screen. You can see now I have three hello worlds. <coughs> Why don't I condense this over a bit? Just not enough screen real estate, that's for sure. So all three of these are exactly the same, and there's obviously reasons why you would do one or the other. The top one, if I'm going to write tons of PHP, I'm going to break my PHP apart, my tags apart, and write my PHP in the middle. If I'm writing a single line of text, I will do it in line like I did here with the PHP echo hello world. However, I'm a super lazy programmer, and if I can save some characters, I mean it's nine characters that I save every single time, I'm going to write it in a shorthand way, just because I find that easier to write. All three of those are acceptable. All three of those would get full marks on any project, no matter what. Okay? So don't feel like you have to marry yourself to any one. Choose the one that you feel you're comfortable with. <clears throat> PHP also supports something called string interpolation. String interpolation is where we evaluate a statement within a set of string characters, right? So, for example, I could evaluate a math statement, right? The, the addition of two numbers, but inside my string. Unfortunately, PHP doesn't support interpolation to that point. PHP supports the interpolation of reading a variable, and that is it. So it will read a variable, it will read a class property, it will read an array, but it will not read anything outside of those uh, immediate return values. So the way that looks, let's write a PHP tag. Let's write a closing PHP tag. We'll create our first variable. We're going to create tons of them, but we'll create our first variable. I'm going to call it dollar sign name and make it equal to my name. And I'm going to end my statement with a semicolon. If I'm writing multiple PHP statements like this, I have to end with a semicolon because PHP is a semicolon delimited language, meaning that every statement terminates with a semicolon. Now to do the string interpolation. I'm going to write echo, hello, and now I want to spit out the value of my variable. I literally just write the variable with the dollar sign. 
You'll even notice that my syntax highlighter knows that I'm using string interpolation. It picks it up because double quotes automatically will parse any variable names that you put within there. It will immediately parse them and spit them out. If it can't find the variable, it'll just write it out as wrong. So it would literally write outside dollar nine side name, right? If I refresh over here, you can now see I have hello Sean McKinnon. <clears throat> what I find only because I find it more readable, I find this hard to read. I find it a lot more readable to actually take my variables and wrap them in a set of curly braces because that to me tells me that I'm interpolating this variable. I know that right off the bat. And the best part about it, if you hit refresh, notice there's no difference in the actual output. The curly braces do not get parsed. Now honestly, you might be asking the question, well, what if I just have a dollar sign and then I just want to output a dollar sign? How do I do that? The way I would do that if I want to output a dollar sign, so let's say echo price colon dollar sign. Uh, variables don't begin with numbers anyways. That's not going to work. Uh, let's write he's big dollar. There we go. See how it's coloring it, right? Now I want to make it so it doesn't color it and doesn't treat that as a variable. I can escape it. And now it says he's big dollar with the dollar sign in front of it. That slash escape is in every single programming language I've ever worked with in my life. Anytime you need to escape a symbol so it just gets outputted as the actual symbol itself, you just put that wonderful backslash in front of it, and then that will output it as whatever it is. <clears throat> Now, as you can see, all of our text is literally running in one solid line. It's not breaking them up into separated lines. And that's because the echo statement is just literally going to output from wherever its point is being called. So wherever you call it, it spits it out. It's not going to add new line characters for you. It's not going to add returns. If we want to actually split up our information, we need to physically add those pieces in place. So the easiest way to do that if we're working in HTML is just simply add another echo statement and literally echo out a break tag. Write it just as you would write it in HTML. <clears throat> I'm going to create a duplicate by hitting Command-Shift-D on my keyboard. It might be Control-D on yours or Alt-D. Whoops, that's wrong. Nope. Yeah. I always forget how to actually move. Oh, yeah, it's command control for me. <clears throat> now I have two break tags. So now what should happen is right here where it says hello Sean should go to a new line, and then he's big dollar should go to the next line. So if I hit refresh in my browser, you'll see that happen because now the break tags are being evaluated. I will say I'm not a big fan of that. I don't like writing break tags as strings. So what I will do usually instead is I would have written it, hello, Sean, using an inline echo statement, write a break tag in actual HTML, and then write another inline statement, right? And just separate it that way. <clears throat> so another point to note, Double quotes are supported in PHP, but so are single quotes. The biggest difference between double quotes and single quotes is double quotes will do string interpolation. So they will evaluate variables. Single quotes will not. They're known as string literals. Everything you type in that string will be what literally gets outputted. Obviously, the inconvenience of single quotes is apostrophes, right? You get an apostrophe and it's like, oh, the whole sentence just terminated at that apostrophe. What do you think we do so that we don't have to deal with that? 
Exactly. The backslash. The backslash will escape that apostrophe and spit it out as a raw character. So we can actually see that. Um, examples are always hard. I don't even know what to write. Here, we'll write it with single quotes. And then I need to escape this one. And there we go. And I have to escape it because it is treating these two as the complete sentence. The escape stops that one from getting treated as finishing off the statement. So we support double quotes, we support single quotes. We do not support backticks as a quote character, just to give you a heads up in case you've used those before. However, we do support concatenation. Concatenation in PHP is different than concatenation in most languages. In Java, do you do string concatenation with plus signs? Yeah. yeah. PHP is the weirdest one of the bunch. It's done with the dot character, like the period, which is super strange, but that's how it's done. So it looks like this. And we'll just put our variable in here. So what that will do is it will literally take hello, it will evaluate name and immediately add it to the string. Then it will evaluate the period that I added at the end and add that to the string. So we'll wind up the whole string. That's concatenation. So no plus signs, only dot characters. I mean, let's add a break tag above that because it's definitely causing an issue. More break tags. So one more thing here. Often, often you will write a variable and you will want to output it for debugging purposes, right? And your variable might be like an array that contains a lot of different information. Echo is very limited. Echo can output only a single level value. So it can output a string, it can output a boolean even, it could output a number, but that is it. It can't output an array. You can't be like, hey, what is in this array? Echo won't work for that. You actually need to use a different syntax to output like all the values in an array, for example. So why don't I show you that next? We'll create a new PHP set of syntax so that you can see it. And I'm just going to write a break tag between these and raw HTML so that it splits them up. And we'll just create a simple array. Dollar sign $r equals 1, 2, 3, and 4 as a list. And now I'm debugging in my code and I can't remember what's in that array and I want to make sure it's populated with the values that I'm expecting to be in there. So I can output those using one of two different methods. The first method I'll show you is var dump. And it takes one argument, and that is what you want to dump out. <clears throat> when you evaluate var dump, when you parse it in your browser, it's going to spit out a bunch of different information about your array. <clears throat> So the first piece is, it tells you the data type it is, so it says array. It tells you how many elements are in that array, so it says four. It provides these curly braces and shows you each array key, so zero through three, right? Then it tells you the data type of the value that's in there, so they're all integers. And then it tells you what value is actually in there, one, two, three. So var dump is super verbose. It tells you so much information. And it gets way worse when you var dump a class. Then you get tons of information, right? So sometimes you don't need all that information. Sometimes you really just want to know what the values are. I just want to know what the hex in the array. That's it. I don't care about the data types because PHP is a loose type language anyways. When that happens, let's write echo 
br, so we can split these two up. When that happens, you can use something called var export. <clears throat> var export is just a simple output. It will take the array and spit it out to the screen, but you'll lose a lot of the information. You still get the fact that it's an array, but it doesn't tell you how many elements are in it. It'll tell you what keys there are, and it will tell you what values they are, but it won't tell you their data types. So it's a quick and easy way to see what's in your array. We'll look at bar dump and bar export a little bit further in the next few weeks when we start doing a lot more debugging. And you'll see how it becomes super crucial when you're trying to evaluate that you actually have content available in that variable that you just set. <clears throat> so cool, that's output and that's comments. Any questions about that so far? Yeah? It's not actually printing out to the screen? Is your Apache server running? Yeah? It's quick and I can help you in like two seconds flat and yeah, go to your browser. Are you sure you're editing that file? That's located in our web underscore PHP Super simple. Though I will say, you were totally like, computer's fault. <laughs> All right. Let's do decision structures, and then we'll take a 10-minute break so I can get some water. Because my throat's getting pretty dry here. <clears throat> decision structures, right? The whole idea of a decision structure is... You know, maybe people don't call them decision structures. Some people just say if statements, right? If statements. They're a way to define a split path in your program, right? So I evaluate this expression and decide which direction I want to go in. That's the whole idea of an if decision structure or control structure. Some people call them control structures. So PHP supports a couple of different decision structures. It's the same standard ones that you guys are used to using. If structures and switches, right? And we'll take a look at both of those. The syntax for these should look identical to what you're used to coding in Java anyways. Uh, there's really no difference between these, the way they're coded in this language. Um, it's exact same in uh, JavaScript as well. So it's like covers multiple languages to what this looks like. So we'll write some PHP tags. <clears throat> and we'll just write a simple if statement. We'll do if. 5 is greater than 4, and a set of curly braces. Just curious, just curious, if anybody knows what a set of these curly braces is representing, what this is called, just the structure here. What's that? No, not a function. It starts with a B. Yeah, it's a block. It's a block. Anytime you see curly braces, those are a block. And it's like that in every single language that you work with. That is called a block. The idea of a block is it is an encapsulated chunk of code. That's the purpose of a block. And you see block structures in many, many different syntax structures, right? You have blocks in if conditions. You have blocks in loops, right? While loops, for loops, for each loops, they all have blocks, right? You have blocks in functions, you have blocks in case or switch statements, and you also have blocks in classes. And notice what all five of those do. They all encapsulate a chunk of code, right, that works within that block, that's only meant for that block. <coughs> block is one of those wonderful buzzwords that makes you sound smarter when you know what it is. <laughs> blocks. We're going to write a chunk of code in our block. We're just going to say echo 
Yep. Because five is greater than four. <laughs> In the very slight chance that we've broken time and space and all physics and five is no longer greater than four, we can write a default statement, right? Default statement would be else. So if the universe has completely changed, and 5 is no longer greater than 4, then we are Dr. Who. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> is that syntax new to anybody? No, same syntax we've seen probably a hundred times, right? Only statement in there that's probably new is echo. Let's take a look at a switch and see if these also match up to what you get in Java. Though the only thing I think in Java is your switch statements are data typed. In PHP, they're not data typed. They're actually very loose. You can do whatever you want with your switch statements. So switch is the word switch with a set of brackets and a block. Does anybody know what's going to go between those brackets, these parentheses? What am I going to put in here? Is that what I want to evaluate? My variable, right? Want to evaluate my variable. So let's create a variable above it. Name equals, I'm going to call my name Sean. So my switch statement is going to evaluate the name. Switches are kind of cool. I like how switches read, I find them actually a lot more human readable than if conditions. The thing about a switch statement is you have this thing inside, this little structure inside known as a case. And what the case does is it basically evaluates a value against that variable. And what it's looking for is an absolute um, equals. Those two things have to be absolutely, strictly equal to each other in order for that case to execute. Right? That's how that works. So that looks like this. So case Sarah echo hey Sarah and then we'll add a break. So the case statement is basically taking Sarah and evaluating it to name. If name is strictly equal to Sarah, then it will echo out, hey Sarah, and then we break. That break tag is super, super, super important. Because what will happen is if it doesn't break, it will go to the next case statement and evaluate the next case statement, even if the first one was true. And it will keep going through each case statement until it finally gets a break or a return and gets out of the switch statement altogether. You can actually use that to your benefit. If you're modifying a piece of text, and you're basically saying, hey, does this meet this condition? Cool, now make it uppercase. Does it meet this condition? Cool, now render it as camel case. Does it meet this condition? You can actually take that one piece of text and start evaluating it multiple times, right? So you can use switch statements and kind of break them and use them hacky-ish. Um, if you want to, to your own convenience. Let's add one more case. If the case is Sean, which will be obviously true, then we're going to echo, hey, Sean, and we're going to break. <clears throat> I have a syntax error. Anybody catch it? That's, the semicolon. That's entirely it. I used a colon when I should have used a semicolon. There we go. <laughs> just like if conditions, just like if conditions, we have a default. So if Sarah is not true and Sean is not true, we can actually provide a default action that happens if neither one of those cases occur, right? 
I just simply write default with a colon. And we'll just write echo, hey, you. And then we'll break. <coughs> This isn't likely new information. Is that the same syntax as Java uses for switches? So it's kind of close, right? Want to see something you can do that's really interesting with switches? A lot of people don't know this about switches. First of all, let's just make sure our switch is actually working. Refresh. Yep, hey, Sean, it's working. <clears throat> Let me show you something really interesting with a switch. <clears throat> What a switch evaluates in here, inside those parentheses, does not have to be a variable. It doesn't have to be a variable at all. It can actually be a raw expression. It could be a function call. It could be whatever you want it to be. It can evaluate anything inside those parentheses. So a really interesting hack that you will see people do on occasion, they'll write switch. True. So now my switch, as long as my case evaluates to true, case 5 is greater than 4, echo yep, now I can actually write conditions as my case statement and do evaluations as my case statements. Which turns switches from being like, yeah, it's basically an if condition, to being like, holy oh, fuck, that thing's cool now. <laughs> that thing has power. It does seriously awesome things, right? And if you evaluate it, we get yep over here. Yep. No, no, you don't. Actually, you're right. So if you have default, you could leave right break gone, and it will just exit out. That's totally fine. You can actually use break to your convenience, because like I said, break is optional. It's not required. So think about that. I can pass switch true. I can make each case whatever evaluation I want, and I can write as many case statements as I want to evaluate without ever writing a break statement, which is great if you want to take something and basically treat it like a factory and build out whatever it is you want to build out just using a switch statement. Switch statements are super powerful. That is supported in JavaScript, PHP, C++. It's supported in many languages. I don't know if it's supported in Java, but maybe next time you're in Java, give it a go. See if it works. <coughs> is this an environment issue again? Is this a final issue? You have a parsing error, unexpected all right. Just give me one second. <laughs> Why don't we take a break? Why don't we take a break for 10 minutes so I can grab some water? And then we'll get back to arrays and hashes, and then we'll move repetition structures and functions in next week, and we'll cover those at the beginning of class the next week, all right? So let's take 10 minutes. <coughs> talk about um, variables. So what we'll do is we'll talk about variables, do that part. Might leave arrays and hashes for next week because... We're going to be doing reading from a database anyways. We'll need to go over arrays. We'll need to be able to iterate over those arrays. So we'll be able to cover that next week anyways. We're not going to miss anything. So unfortunately, Git took us a little bit of time, and I think I solved our problems. <laughs> like one Google search, and right there is the answer. But we're not going to go back to that right now. All right. If you scroll up, you'll see that there's PHP tags. And just a little further down, there's variables and data types. So I have probably, I don't know if this is good news for you or bad news for you. I have no idea. It depends on how you take it. Some people are like, yes, it's awesome. Some people are like, eh, I don't know. PHP doesn't have strict data types. So you know how in Java, when you define a variable, you have to say this is its data type. It's a string. It's an integer. It's a float. 
it's a double, it's whatever, right? You don't have to do that in PHP. It has what's called implicit data typing, which means when you set a value to a variable, it will evaluate the variable and automatically know what data type that variable is. Gets better. A variable is not married to the data type it's been set with. So if you have a variable called string, for example, and you make it equal to a string, like your name, you can then later on change that to a number. You can then later on change it to a boolean or an array. It doesn't matter because once it's set, it's not permanently set. It can be consistently changed and consistently change the data type that's associated with it as well. PHP is an extremely loose language. I like to call it a slutty language because it just allows everything. It doesn't care, has no opinions, right? But I think the more professional term, and I don't really consider it professional, is called duct typed. Duck type means if it walks like a duck or quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? That's what PHP essentially does with variables. If it looks like a string, it smells like a string, it is likely a string. That's the way it works. So we're going to write some data typed values into some variables. So let's create a set of opening and closing PHP uh, tags. Now, one interesting thing about PHP, this is not valid. PHP requires you to set a value. When you initialize a variable, you have to set a value. You have no choice. It's different when it comes to classes. You are allowed to set properties without values, which you know classes would be garbage if you couldn't do that. Um, but you can't do that with variables. They have to have an initializer value. So we can do string, my string, right? It's equal to a string. Oh, forgot the equal sign. I think that's kind of important. Definitely getting late in the evening. If I want a boolean, I can set it to true, right? Or I can set it to false. Can't remember if PHP evaluates zero as false. I'll get back to you on that. I think it might actually evaluate zero as false. And one is true. <clears throat> Integer, 10, yep. Sorry, say that one more time. At least I don't, I can't remember. Maybe there is. Um, let's just double check. I might be wrong. Okay, I've got like tons of things in the way here. Equals, yeah. So this is equal to this. And actually, I think you're right. I think there is strict equals, actually. Yeah, there is strict equals. So 
Yeah, so that is a good point. Um, because PHP is an interpretive thing, if it looks like a very, uh, this thing, then it must be this thing. A string three is equal to a number three. Those things are equal to each other. They are not strictly equal, though. So if you have two equal signs, they are equal to each other. But if you have three equal signs, they will evaluate as false because they're not the same data type and value. Does that make sense? So what two equal signs evaluates, so if I change the statement to two equal signs and refresh, you can see it says equals yet. That's because it's saying, hey, are these two values equal to each other? And yes, they are. Three is three. But when you type three equal signs, and we don't get it out, it says, are these two values equal to each other, and are their data types exactly the same? Which they're not, because one's a string and one's an integer, right? So they're not equal to each other. <clears throat> Which also makes me wonder, does 3.0 Equal three. No, it does not. Does it loosely equal three? Yes, it does. So that's important to understand too. <laughs> All right, let's keep writing. Dollar sign decimal. Ten point five. None of these really matter. Like all these variable names I'm using, you can call them Bob, Mike, Sarah, Dave, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm just writing variable names. The values, as you can see, they're just immediately interpreted as whatever you've written in beside them. Now, what's a little bit more interesting about variables is you can actually store complex structures into variables. And I'm not talking complex structures like this one. That's known as a hash in PHP. <clears throat> That's a complex structure, right? It has keys. You would reference it by its keys, right? <clears throat> I'm talking even stranger complex structures, like super weird ones like this. I want to call that function, I just called that function. Variables are just containers, and they can literally hold anything. They can hold class definitions in them. You can literally dump a whole class definition into a variable in PHP. You can dump for hashes, arrays, or just simple data types. It doesn't matter. Variables in PHP are super powerful. We'll look at more of what that's doing at a later point. Don't worry about it if it's confusing now. So one more thing that we should look at as well is how what the rule sets are around a variable. Variables have specific rule sets. One, you can define variables only with a dollar sign in front of them. All variables in PHP have to have a dollar sign in front of them. If you're missing the dollar sign, they will blow up because they're not, they don't mean anything, okay? So you always need the dollar sign. Underscores, a lot of people like underscores, especially if they're naming off variables that they want to treat as like a globalized variable or maybe it's a uh, function level variable, but it has the same name as one of the variables outside of the function. So they'll name it with an underscore after it. That is completely valid. You can, in fact, have 25 underscores there if you want to. It doesn't matter. This is 
Valid. Equals, yep. That is a valid naming convention for a variable in the PHP. If you're so inclined to use camel case, like obviously you can. That's totally valid. It's, however, not the common convention in PHP. The common naming convention for variables in PHP are with underscores. Things you can't do. You can't use spaces, obviously. Other things you can't do. No dashes. Those will blow up. And the one that's kind of odd that you can't do, but is pretty much applicable in every language you ever work in, you can't begin a variable with a number. It's not valid. All three of those are absolutely invalid. Another thing to note, avoid using the variable names this and self. They're reserved keywords. Okay? So try not to use those variable names because you will wind up with issues with them blowing up because they're reserved keywords. And you've got everything with the dollar sign. You always start a variable with a dollar sign. Oh, you're saying like dollar sign, dollar sign? Yeah, so that means something slightly different, but yes, you can. You can do this. You can have two dollar signs, but it gets a bit more interesting because you can have what's known as a variable variable, which is where, I'll show you what I mean. It, it's, it's super weird. So I have a variable called name and I've made it equal to Sean, okay? And then I have this variable dollar sign, dollar sign, name equal to McKinnon. And when I want to access the variable, I can access echo dollar sign Sean. That's dynamic variabling, which is kind of meta programming, so we probably won't cover it because it like gets a bit crazy. Kind of like pointers. Yeah, it's a lot like pointers, actually, yes. But it's called, it's called variable variables in PHP. It allows you to instantiate variables dynamically. And then you can use those dynamic variables after that point. Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. So that's variables in a nutshell. Don't really pay too much attention to it. Simple rules, no numbers, no spaces, no dashes. Those are the big rules, right? Just remember those three. <laughs> Everything else is kind of sugar on top. Yeah, question? What's that? Which type? 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 So just, uh, here's an interesting tidbit for your IDE. Some IDEs require you to hold down Alt, some require you to hold you down Control. But if you hold down Alt or Control, uh, you can create multiple cursors. See how I have three flashing cursors? And then now I can call a command on all three of those at the same time. So some IDEs, it's Alt and click. Some of them it's Control and click. If you're on a Mac, it's a manual. But you can create multiple that's your little first IDE shortcut. All right, so we'll end class there. Next week, we're doing CRUD. We'll start with create and read. We're going to actually connect to a database. We'll create a brand new database so we don't conflict with your MySQL class. 
The only thing I'll recommend that you uh, avoid doing is when you hit the point in your MySQL class where you guys learn how to drop a database, try not to drop this class's database. Drop your MySQL class for the other class. Don't drop ours. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, the quiz is open until the following week because we still need to cover the last little bit of Git. Um, so I've opened it up till next Thursday. So you have like a whole week to complete it. The password is not password, so write it down somewhere. Anyways, have a good night. <laughs>